And also, yes. yeah, and also what you're tied to is their treatment of you. We unconsciously take on treating ourselves the way we were treated. So when we are treated poorly, we learn to treat ourselves poorly as well. And in the fairy tale, he cuts her hands off to save his own self from the devil. So he will damage his daughter, take off her hands. And the hands represent creativity, reaching out, hugging, bringing in all kinds of things. And symbolically, if you peel it off, it tells a great deal about difficult wounding father-daughter relationship. Welcome back to Grow Dreams podcast with me, Shailen Fair. I'm so happy you've returned because today's conversation is insightful, deep, and vulnerable because I do share about my own experience with my father and also about some dreams, which our guest, Susan E. Schwartz, helps me unpack. She is a Jungian analyst. She will explain to you what that is. She's a psychologist as well as an author. She has written a book called The Absent Father Effect on Daughters. I would say that this conversation definitely applies to both daughters and sons. So guys, you can also listen in and find it insightful and helpful for you as well. She investigates the impact of absent physically or emotionally and inadequate fathers on the lives and psyches of the daughters through the perspective of Jungian analytical psychology. This book tells the stories of daughters who describe the insecurity of self, the splintering and disintegration of the personality, and the silencing of voice. I have put all the links to Susan's online presence in the show notes and in the description box below. You can go over and listen, watch this and listen to this on YouTube. Also, you can like, subscribe and share if you enjoy this conversation and find it helpful. You can drop me a message on Instagram at Grow Your Dreams Podcast and I will reply to you. I would love to know how this conversation has affected you and what you found helpful in it. You can also now click on a donate button which will be in uh, all the descriptions below. And if you would like to support the show financially, there is now an option to do that. All the money will be used to help fund all the online platforms that I pay monthly to use here on Grow Your Dreams. So now that I've done all the introduction, sit back, relax, and enjoy this chat. Welcome, Susan. It's a real honor for me to have you on the show. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you again for having me and for being so patient as we go through this process. Awesome. Yeah, we had a little bit of a glitch before we came on, but you sorted it out your end. So well done. <laughs> and normally these interviews and all well, these chats are just very casual and relaxed. So feel relaxed, feel at home here on Grow Your Dreams. And one of the first things I want to jump into is just find out a bit more about you. So you're a, a are you a Jungian psychologist? Is that correct? I think you would say analyst and Jungian analyst. And the different the difference is that um, a psychologist, and I'm going to be very general, deals a lot with the conscious world. So an analyst deals with conscious and unconscious. Wow. And so to bring the two together to make some other kind of awareness of oneself. And that's of yourself, of others, of the world. So it's really the combination of all the things that are going on inside of us and making us aware of them. We oftentimes react without even thinking or considering things might be different. And by doing that, we continue the same old thing we couldn't stand. Yes. And so an analyst, it's like peeling the things apart that bother us, not necessarily from a pathological way, but from try to understand why did this get developed? Where did you learn it? And what are you passing on? And how are you still caught in your old 
wilderness. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's an amazing explanation. Wow. That gives me a lot to think about already. We can <laughs> end, end the podcast there. No. Um, so, so um, how did you get into um, being a young analyst and why? What drew you to that? Well, oh my goodness. So many things. But let me say in general, one of the things that draws people to an analytical approach, and oftentimes this happens with people who don't even know what analysis is at all, but they want to know more. So, okay, they they want the symptom to be fixed, but they also want to know more about themselves. It's like, well, where did that come from? Why am I doing that still? How come all my relationships seem to be the same? You know, even if I change partners, this, that, who, who am I really is, is actually the question. And so it's, um, hmm. it's a search for oneself when you don't even know what you're searching for. Yes. So it's always got to be deep, high, wide, more than you even expect. And so for myself, you know, I was like many people, I had a space in my life and I went, huh, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Hmm. I mean, that can happen at any point, really. And, you know, I heard a lecture by a Jungian analyst and I went, oh, that's what I want. I had no hmm. idea when I went there that that would even be possible. Mm-hmm. And it just, it just, it's like a drop from the sky. That's why it's really important to pay attention to all the things that just happen because they're meant. They're really mm-hmm. meant. And mm-hmm. so I took it seriously and boom, there I went. Yeah. Yes. And you, and you studied in Zurich? Is that correct? I did. I yeah. did. And I actually I'm an- love Switzerland. So when I saw that in your bio, I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> Yes, it's lovely. It was lovely. But I can tell you, when I began, I didn't know I would live in Switzerland for three years. That wasn't actually my plan. So I think, you know, like like the psyche, things happen to us. And then we go, oh, that's right. And that's right. And that's right. And things just happened in that way. Yeah. Not, not easily, not easily, yes. but yeah, not easily at all. And, and I would say the person, and, and this fits with what I had written about, et cetera, but the person that I was listening to when I first decided I want to be an analyst uh, was somebody who was talking about a fairy tale. So a fairy tale or legends of a culture or whatever, they tell a lot about the process of becoming yourself. And, you know, you have to go through, you know, you have to walk through the snow with a paper dress and you don't have the ax that you need and all these kinds of things along the way. And it, it's very parallel to yes. what happens psychologically. Yes, yeah. totally agree. And this is a, a little bit of a new world for me. I'm, you know, discovering young, starting to, you know, read into, you know, some of his stuff. And I think, I mean, as far as I'm aware, a lot of people are not aware of this thing called the psyche or their unconscious self. That, <clears throat> that's exactly right. And I think one of the things that happens is that uh, either they might be afraid of it they're worried about what they will find out. Um, also, they might be afraid of their own potential. Hmm. So, Interesting. Yeah. But, you know, people say kind of blithely, oh, I'm afraid of failure. Uh, I think it might be I'm afraid of really trying to evolve into all that I am. That's really harder. Because it's, I, because it's a heavy responsibility, you have to put the work in. Is that why? Or you have to you put say? the work in anyway, but you have to put the work in to get up every day. So you are right. It is, it is a responsibility to yourself and also to other people. If yes. people are aware 
I mean, really aware, you could ask yourself, I mean, would we be involved in all the awful things we're involved in? I don't know, but um, maybe we wouldn't just go along with things. We might question more. We might wonder. We might say, what traditions am I just following just to follow? Or am I, I'm going to link it back to my book, or am I just doing what my father told me to that I didn't like? And am I like him as well? Yeah in all the ways I didn't like. And did I just go along with something because somebody said you should? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, And you have to put a lot of thought and work mentally into that to sift through, I guess, where your beliefs are coming from, you know, and people maybe aren't willing to put in that work. I, well, I think, I think some people are not willing. I would say that... A lot of people don't really know how to do it, and they don't know, right? Basically, how do you do it? Well, um, you know, in my book, I have a lot of people's dreams and their stories. Every single night we dream. Yes. The question is, what do you do with the dreams? Do you just say, oh, you know, they're nothing and this was stupid? No. You say, oh, I had this dream. What does it mean? Or I had this dream theme. Or I found myself at this place that I've been at before, and you pay attention to it. And then oftentimes what people do is, because you really can't find out about yourself alone, it's too hard, it's not possible, Um, but people go and talk to somebody, and and depending on how much they want to know, they'll go and talk to somebody they'll really fit with, or they'll go and talk to somebody to then feel better. Well, that will last about three weeks. And then, then it'll all come yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. So again, yeah. it's like what you said, how many people are really willing to put the effort in? Uh, hopefully enough. Yeah. Hopefully enough. Yeah. Not the majority, but a yeah. lot. What about when, um, uh, how do you differentiate between like navel gazing or when you are getting too introspective? Do you know what I mean? Or when it's actually productive and a wholesome process? Yeah, <clears throat> you could say that that, that kind of navel gazing, um, you know, you have to go around and around and around an issue in order to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, Jung has this beautiful term. It's from alchemy. It's called circumambulatio. And, and it's from the Middle Ages. And it's really beautiful. And it rep- I think it's Latin. And it represents moving around and around and around. And, it, you know, it's like what you had said a little bit ago. It takes effort. <clears throat> but if you are going around and around and nothing is changing, and you're not really gaining any more knowledge of yourself. You're probably just navel gazing. Okay. And not not in a meditative, healthy way, but in usually negative, poor self regard. I hate yes. myself. This is terrible. I'm not all right. Trying to fix I, yourself all the time. Exactly, and and never getting to what the real issue is. So it looks like you're doing something, but you're really not, yeah. really not, because you're just, again, going nowhere, and there is yeah. no inner or outer real shift. Yeah. 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 That's good. That's good. Let's go into your book then, because, um, well, firstly, I loved it. It was amazing. I, I When I picked it up, it was on my journey of like just discovering young. And so I didn't even realize, you know, that you would speak about young and, you know, these theories. So that was, that was awesome. It was just, you know, puzzle pieces coming together. Um, and me going through my own journey of um, unpacking, understanding and growing in my own father wounds. So I have said on this show before that I had an absent father, an abusive father, and he was, he was he was all of the, the the damaging father kind of archetype so um 
yeah which actually later on I need to, I do need to tell you a dream and see what you think um yeah you might like that um so the book is called The Absent Father Effect on Daughters Father Desire Father Wounds I'm very interested to know what led you to write this book specifically about fathers and daughters and the wound uh, well you know um in my in my work and also with colleagues and friends, um, I encountered a lot of women. I won't say this isn't true for men, because it is, but this is on the side of women. Um, and what should I say about that? Women and people who identify as women, I guess mm -hmm. we could say as well, because a lot of people would come in and they would say, well, my father was great when I was little. This is the typical story. And then I was about three and he left <clears throat> or they got divorced or he was drunk or something and he separated from her. So he was a sweetie. He could play. But to become really a person who could guide share, develop, encourage, support, all those words, be wise. He wasn't. And story after story, and all of these daughters excused him. I would say, wait a second, didn't you say, I don't like this? No. And there were many excuses why. And I knew that under the excuses were, uh, there was fear, there was apprehension, they didn't know even what to say. The father was so shut off, so shut off that there was no way to reach him. And the other time that is significant is around 12 or 13. And usually that's when the daughter is developing into a woman. The father does, is classic. The father doesn't know how to handle or encourage her beauty, her sports, her mind, her being. And so he kind of pushes her away because he can't handle his own envy, his own desire, his own ability to be appropriately loving. The wow. amount of, yeah, the amount of women that I have spoken to, I will say, did your father say he loved you? No. No. Did you not miss it? Well, it was never there. Yeah. It was never there. There was another very surprising thing that happened. Um, and that was, I was speaking with some analysts, some Jungian analysts. And one woman said, you know, this reminds me, I don't ask very much about fathers. This is an analyst. And actually, in the analytic literature, the psychological literature, very little has been written until about the last 30 years. And if you go back, Freud, Jung, quite a few were raised by very distant fathers, not emotional. Jung had one essay on fathers. One. He wrote 20, I don't know, 20 books, more than that, more than that. And even in that, it, the issue is he had four daughters. Yeah. <laughs> and he wrote one essay. And so people will say, oh, well, he was doing other things. Okay, he was. But why are the daughters always forgotten? Oh. What? Yeah. And even now, even now, 2022, why are the daughters still forgotten in some ways? Hmm. I, I think that they are. You know, it's like we have moved culturally and psychologically, but the gap of the daughters being addressed in a uh, respectful, honoring what they might go through, what is being passed on through the generations, not so much. Um, yeah. Another analyst said to me, why did you write this book? I said, because there's only three Jungian books on this, three or four. Mm. Yes. Oh, yeah. So it, it's, it, you know, when you kind of unpeel the layers, 
you say, wait a second, it's not just our rather patriarchal dominated culture, but it is what have we integrated that we have gone along with and excused. Mm -hmm. And I could feel also the hurt. And Mm -hmm. I went, this wasn't looked at, so I think that I will. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's really what propelled it. I mean, it's been going on for quite a while, but that was really what was behind it is that absence of attention. Yeah. Yeah. So talk me through a bit. uh, What are the psychological psyche and conscious effects in the daughter? What happens inside of the daughter when the father is either emotionally absent? It's probably a very loaded question or physically absent. Um, Yeah, I would say because because on my on my experience, um, it took me a long time to even acknowledge the uh, you know the absence because did, I think you talk about you know it's like you're dismissed. It's almost like you can't even acknowledge the absence because you're not aware of the absence. But it's it becomes this very abstract thing which you can't grab hold of. But it is affecting your life so much but you almost can't reach the root of where it's coming from because the father's not there, but you don't know he's not there. And it just becomes this very deep thing going on inside of you. So my own experiences are definitely, you know, depression, deep insecurity, um, you know, the, the emptiness, the empty space that he leaves behind. But maybe you can unpack that a bit more for maybe women who are listening or even fathers who are listening or husbands or wives who have, you know, had absent fathers. If you could unpack what's going on inside that woman in maybe a bit of more of a concrete way than I've described. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to say, um, I hope you don't mind this, but just no. in looking, just in looking at you, um, you are quite a bit like m- many of the people that I am talking about, which is that. Visually, visually, you look great. Interesting, intriguing, lively, able, can do these, knows how to operate in the world, competent. So that's the outer. Inside, there is, it's really disparate and it creates like a dissonance. So the world sees this, and almost can't believe it when you say, I was depressed. They look and they say, oh, come on. They don't believe it. A lot of people don't understand. They can't get it. They want to talk you out of it. But that absence, the absence, and where I really got that from was a quite famous um, Freudian psychoanalyst, French, who talked about the absence. So the absence is not that the person wasn't, was, it isn't only that the parent wasn't there, the father wasn't there. It's that his psyche wasn't there. His inner world was absent. So like you said, mm-hmm. you kind of reach in to try to figure out what is this absence and you get like air because that father was either preoccupied, he was gone, he was this, he was that. He never learned how to be a father. So he has a whole absent psyche inside of himself. And then as the daughter, we pick up from the parents their own psychology as well. Mm. Jung speaks about this often, the effects of the parents onto the psyche of the children. Not what was said, what was not said. So the absence, although it is incredibly painful and it's like, how do I figure my life out when there was no uh, road signs? The absence means you get to be creative. The absence is like a, a space of emptiness. And the question is, how will you fill it? How will you create from inside yourself the, because the material is already there. We are born with it. The question is who nurtures it? If nobody nurtures it, it sits there 
until you find a space that someone will help nurture it. Sometimes people get mentors, they go into analysis or therapy, they have a good teacher. There's all kinds of ways that that absence, which can be so overwhelming, um, can be filled. But I do want to say another thing, which is that the absent father affects the body of the daughter. And that is oftentimes not discussed either. Wow. So <clears throat> yeah, one's body image, care, care of your body. Um, not just not just dieting, because that's very rude and intrusive, but it's a relationship with one's body so you feel alive. And you can, <clears throat> the question would be, it is really hard to feel alive when you've had that much absence. Mm -hmm. It's not possible, but it has an effect on the body. And the reason I mention it also is that learning about oneself is not just a mind trip. It's also a body trip. Yes. It's a physical experience of living and being yourself. And the absent father creates also the wound to the body. Mm. I mean, you can, this is an extension. I don't, I can't say that it's always true, but you could ask, how come so many women, young girls cut themselves? Mm. So they're cutting to feel, but where were their fathers? I'm not yes. saying it's, it's not only fathers, but it's mostly uh, females that cut. And what are they doing? They're trying to feel. So here's mm -hmm. that awful absence that has created a certain numbness inside mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. So physically and psychologically, the mm -hmm. absent father has a huge effect. Mm. So with, with somebody mm -hmm. who's had a dad around and he's done, you know, lots of the providing maybe physically how would you know because we don't know what we don't know true you know if, if, so if someone has you know got some issues in their life and it's all coming down to this root of the father was emotionally absent he was there how would they um how would they begin to realize that it, it, it will come down to discussing it with someone else I guess or mm -hmm. it does it does it would also come out in relationships so it in would what way? communication, <laughs> yeah, communication, being able to communicate feelings, being able to find interest in the other, being able to uh, relate deeply, not hide. You see, that's the other thing. A lot of people learn to hide their emotions and their feelings, and it messes up a relationship. So you would see the effect of the father in a relationship. And that's a relationship of either sex. I don't think it matters. Yeah. A quite similar dynamic comes out. <clears throat> but you can find out more about yourself also in your dreams. You could say, what, is, what does the father look like in the dreams? And, and the other thing is that it brings up the ability to question. So a lot of people will say, oh, oh, he was there. He, he gave you this, that, really? Okay, he gave it to you. Uh, that doesn't mean that he really was a good father. And the excuses allow the daughter to remain unconscious. So if she can question herself, if she can allow herself to have her dreams, I mean her daydreams, but also her night dreams, and really piece into that phrase of he did the best he could. Well, maybe he didn't. Mm -hmm. And maybe his best was not good enough. Maybe it wasn't yeah. good enough. And I think there is something about questioning what we learn to excuse that creates more consciousness. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, I'm just going to let it settle for a moment. Wow. Wow. So if you were to talk to a father who you see is being absent, you know, he's got a young daughter, uh -huh. you know, he is around physically, but emotionally he's not there, not engaged. And maybe the, the little girl's about, you know, between three and five or three and six. And you want to 
um, cheer him on to be an emotionally engaged father and you want to explain what this is going to, you know, the, the impact it will have on her if she doesn't, if he doesn't engage or if he does, what would you say to that dad? Okay. So you want, to, you want to grow a good dad. How would you do yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would actually, um, I would want him to figure out inside of himself why he's avoiding being a father and does he even know what it is and does he know how to relate to his daughter like who played games with him who read stories who sat with the computer together because that's what we do now who who taught him and how did he feel about his own father so his self-exploration will automatically help him deal with his daughter. And because the daughter is also of a different gender, what, is he apprehensive? How is he in touch with his own feminine side, his own masculine parts? And I don't want to define what those are because they're just different and they're a range. But is he comfortable with masculine, feminine, the range of them and what is he really teaching his daughter and just to examine to examine and examine and examine how did he fall into this how is he also relating to his partner because that's also going to affect the daughter so when she sees the parental couple whoever they are relating well together she is going to learn better relating for herself as well. Mm. So here you want to also have a very present father figure who can well relate to his partner. Feelings, emotions, expression, creativity, challenge. It moves the traditional father role out of something which so doesn't apply anymore and yet is still very prevalent. Mm. What, what do you mean by the traditional father role? If you, if you were to explain that just in more like bullet points, what does that look like? Uh, okay, this is going to be kind of in an outer way, but if you look at the whole world, um, it's changing, but historically, most countries have been run by men. So that trickles down culturally. Corporations still run by men or by a male-dominated way. But it's very um, hierarchical, and it doesn't leave room for others very much. And I think the hope and the value is that things are really changing. Mm -hmm. So that the old father role in the family disciplinarian, authoritarian, he's the ruler. I mean, that's old, but I hear those stories still. I am amazed that they- Do you mean like a dominant father who- Domineering, yeah. domineering. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and then how do you, how does one, how do you deal with, if you're dominated, then all of your good energy gets suppressed and pushed down. And that, of course, creates wounds to the mm. personality. You can't manifest yourself. Mm. Yeah. So the so father I, helps the daughter manifest herself as she's growing, yeah. I, I would hope so. I don't think it's happening enough. Yeah, but it's the place that wants to change. So that's the other thing of why I wrote the book, because the point is also hope, that as we gain more consciousness, then the hope is that uh, everybody can, or we pass it on. And, and also, the book wasn't just for daughters. It, as you said, it really is also for fathers to gain an awareness of who they are and what they are doing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And how does the, the daughter help the, the father? You know, because it's a, it's a two-way relationship. Totally. 
Well, doesn't she then present him with what she wishes, what she needs from him, what she has learned about herself, and given him the opportunity to change? Mm. You know, I so the daughter in that way can be the teacher to the father. Wow. Of course, there is another issue, which is that the father himself is probably wounded in the very places that she needs. So he might or might not be able to do it. And then she really has to mourn the fact that there's a loss that she will not get the father that she wanted and really needed. It won't happen. It, it's very sad. I mean, we're kind of born needing parental guidance. And yeah. yeah, and most people don't want to mourn the loss of the image that they thought they were going to get. So mm -hmm. part of becoming oneself is mourning that you won't have that good father. Mm. You just won't. It, it's really, no matter what you do, no matter how you try, it's also not up to the daughter completely. As you said, it, it's, it's a dual mm. relationship. So both mm. have to be open. And mm. some people are not. Yes. Some people are just not, yeah. Yes. Well, I, I think that is so important. That was one of the big, there's a few things in my journey which were just key moments and, you know, aha moments for me. And one of them was uh, mourning the loss of something I should have had and didn't. Exactly. You know, and that was the, the loss of this, this father that was needed. Right. And that was definitely part of the release, I think, in my own heart and so for me I grew up as a Christian and so believing in God and you know having a very strong faith and um, obviously it's very based around forgiveness and so when I was growing up and I, I saw who who my father was and you know the things that he did and you know the offenses against me and I, I automatically forgave without actually mm. realizing I needed to actually cry and be a bit angry and realize like, oh, I've lost something here instead of just jumping straight to forgiveness, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. So, yeah, so I, I found that, you know, in my early mid-20s, you know, through my whole, you know, teenage years, I was just like, forgive, 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 forgive. But then things started to unravel, I think, in my life. And I realized, oh, wow, this, this relationship and lack of relationship ha is actually affecting me pretty much every single day. With, do you know what I mean? In my feeling toward myself, in my right. insecurity in relationship, you know. And I think in, in my uh, ability, in my confidence in myself, basically, you know, constant self-doubt and, yeah, so the grieving was a definite, uh, a, a very, very good door to walk through towards, I think, healing, beginning to heal the wound. Um, I, yeah. Yes, you say it um, quite eloquently. And sadly, I, I hear that too. Mm. But mm. yeah, yeah, exactly. But you know, um, one does, if you think about it, when you let go of that uh, need to forgive, which goes actually nowhere in a certain way, because you're forgiving and nothing has changed. So mm -hmm. it, it didn't make you feel better. Um, but if you really mourn and you really grieve the loss, then you've made a space to create something else. And then something else can grow there. And you don't have to be hounded so much with insecurities and bad feelings because the absent father creates the insecurities, because you can't figure out when you're a child, how come he doesn't pay attention? Why is he always busy with something else? How come he hit me? Why is he screaming? How come he's silent? 
You can't figure it. And so automatically, because the child goes, it must be me. Mm-hmm. It isn't. But, but the father, unfortunately, in many instances, says it's you when it actually really is not. And you, you, you take it on anyway whether he says it or he doesn't. And it creates all this confusion inside. And even when you said about yourself, you can't find the core of yourself with all of that stuff blocking it. Mm. You know, it's like stuff in the way of your core. And so when you stop forgiving and began to mourn, it's like tears cleared the air. Definitely. And I think that's when actually real forgiveness can happen, when you actually accept the reality of the situation, when you grieve it, and then it, then you can actually let go, if that makes sense, and actually forgive let, and release that person. You, you can let go, but would you want to forgive someone for treating you badly? No, you would wish that they would gain awareness of what they did. And so they are left to do their own work, to find what they really did and be able to come to you and say, that was awful. I was in a bad space. This is what happened on and on. Mm. I think we all have to do our work. Mm. So I don't want, you know, too many people getting off the hook here. Yeah, because I understand because what you're saying. Yes. And I think, know. yeah, I think when I talk about forgiveness as well, it's not it's definitely not letting someone off the hook or, or you know, because they are responsible. But I think it's in a way of releasing that person from me that they owe me something now to make me better. Oh, exactly. Because then, you know, unconsciously, you're tied to them. And also... Yes. Yeah. And also what you're tied to is their treatment of you. We unconsciously take on treating ourselves the way we were treated. So when we are treated poorly, we learn to treat ourselves poorly as well. Well, well, say that again. So say that last two Um, sentences again. Yeah, I think you got it, though. When we, we treat ourselves automatically the way we were treated. So when the father was horrendous in many different ways and also absent, we treat ourselves similarly, absent, abusive, destructive, not appreciative. So we are automatically taking on the very thing we did not like and we are retaining the connection which was destructive. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. If, if, you, if you read, you know, one of the things in Jungian psychology is symbols and the meaning in symbols. And so those come through dreams. But if you also look at any of the fairy tales of all cultures of the world, the daughter always leaves the father's kingdom and never returns. I don't know if there's ever one where she comes back, no matter what culture. Part of it is because one has to grow away from the original family and the father. But part of it is because he wasn't very good to her. He didn't see her. He abused her. He maltreated. He was unconscious. And so she has to go away and find her own self. Mm. It's kind of a classical archetypal mm. story. Yes. Mm-hmm. Is there um, an archetypal fairy tale, or even I know you you mention a biblical story as well in your book. Is there is there a story that really is one of your favorites, just in its sim- symbolism? Yeah. Well, the one that fits with the absent father very, very much. I mean, quite a few of them do. But uh, The Handless Maiden was quite popular um, a while ago. And in it, so it speaks of the absent father. 
he sells the daughter to the devil because he doesn't see her. So that in the fairy tale, he doesn't see her. And that's the absent father. He doesn't see her. And the reason for the second part of the title is that desire to always have him, even though he created all the wounds. Hmm. Yeah. And in the fairy tale, he cuts her hands off to save his own self from the devil. So he will damage his daughter, take off her hands. And the hands represent creativity, reaching out, hugging, bringing in all kinds of things. And symbolically, if you peel it off, it tells a great deal about difficult wounding father-daughter relationships. Mm. Mm. Wow, so good. So, so good. So we've, we've, we've not got long left and I want to, we've unpacked a lot about what the father wound is. If you just take the next few minutes to encourage the the daughter, or if it's a male listening, the son, on how to begin to uh, create that healing. Give us some stepping stones. Yes, yes, yes. Of course I yeah. will. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, because I think that, you know, when we're kind of caught in whatever we're caught in, we never know where to go. I mean, it you know, it's not just given out in some kind of booklet, etc. But I would say really paying attention to dreams, I think is helpful. I also think journaling how one feels throughout the day, throughout the day. I also think it's being aware of these automatic words that we lay on ourselves all day long that maybe we don't pay attention to. It also is checking in with people we are in relationship with. What do you think about this? Or how do you see me? Or how do you see me with you? Is another way of, of doing it. I also think you can't get it totally, but I do think it helps to read things. I, I not Not garbage, but really things that hit oneself. Uh, art also tells a great deal of what is going on emotionally. You know, what what is one's favorite something and why? How to get in touch with one's emotions. And I think also there's another thing, which is having patience. Because we yes. live in very fast paced cultures. If the computer doesn't work in 30 seconds, we are really upset. And but internally, it's giving oneself space and time to yes. really contemplate. Um, even, I think you had intimated this at the beginning, meditating also helps. Um, exercise, eating well. These are all things that create consciousness. It's not out of restrict yourself, live rigid, and also play and joy they help Love yeah that. they help find oneself i mean you can't yes. just sit right down in it it's like what do you love to do that will release energy consciousness mm. because the journey takes a lot of energy mm. and it gives a lot of energy you said about release well can we could imagine all the energy that is people hold on to to repress, not know. If that gets opened, oh my goodness. Mm. It's so I've been kind of vague, but but specific at the same time, I think, about yes. what it is to find oneself. And yes. uh, it's a journey. It's a journey. I think it's lifelong. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because yeah. I would say I started to become more aware when I was, you know, in my my early mid 
twenties and I'm in, you know, 33 now. So it's been a, it's been almost a 10 year journey, I think for me. And uh, so only recently have I discovered young and like, Oh, okay. You know, things making even more sense to me. So, um, and let me, let me finish with a dream. Yes, please. I, I didn't forget. I was going to ask you. <laughs> I'll share, I'll share one of them. I was contemplating between the two. Um, I'll share this 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 one that I had recently because I think it, it's it's just encouraging. But I um two very important dreams that I've had have been about houses. And the second one that I had very recently was about a very shacky looking house with you know broken windows and it just didn't look good. And I knew in the dream that was me, that was my house. That's what it was that was me and I didn't want it to be and I didn't want to live there because it just it did not look great and it looked very uncomfortable and you know and then the next thing in the dream the next scene was a very big strong double story um it looked like you know something that would have a vineyard growing around it and it was going to be painted pink so it hadn't been finished painted being painted yet and this voice in the dream said to me, um, it said, the old house had been taken apart and everything the old in the old house had been reconstructed into this new house. So the words were, it's been deconstructed and it's now being reconstructed and nothing's been lost. So I would know like, oh, that old beam from that house has now been used in this part of the house to, you know, add this feature and um, I guess I woke up knowing that our experiences, you know, nothing, nothing has to be lost. That's what, it, that's what it meant to me. Because, you know, our lives may, may have brokenness. Um, you know, we may feel a bit desolate. But there is this process we can go on where things can be reconstructed and in some, into something big and beautiful and yes you can live in <laughs> yes yeah, so i what just have a couple, ah, i think it's an amazing dream because you know that the house is oneself you could yeah. look at it you know in a general way the house is oneself yeah. and um where one lives where one lives inside and outside and the the change from the shacky place all of the material, but that's true psychologically. So all the material of us gets rearranged and yours is being rearranged in quite a classy way. Don't you think? I mean, yeah. sounds like a very pretty house. It's also bigger. Sounds bigger. It is. Yes. It, the size is bigger. I would wonder why it's pink. That's what I was going to ask you what your thoughts were. Well, well, I wondered if it was like an Italian villa. Mm. Yes. You know, in the Mediterranean, the the houses oftentimes are pink, uh, light colors um, like that. So that was kind of my projection and my idea. So I don't know what it meant to you. Mm -hmm. um, pink is oftentimes associated with a female. So yeah. that also might be. But mm -hmm. even when you said all the, the beam from this house goes to this one, this part goes over here. It's reconstructed, and Jung calls it the process of transformation. Wow. And, yeah, and it is the process of taking yourself and making it not always larger, but different. You have a very different style house from the first shaggy into the other one. It sounds more elegant. The, Definitely, yes. Yeah, exactly. And stronger, the, secure. I want to live in the new one, the, the new construction. Well, <laughs> exactly. Well, you could also say that dreams um, mirror what is going on in the unconscious. And often they tell what has already happened. So it's like they're sending a message. You already got your pink house. Of course, it's not fully painted yet. So it kind of implies there's more to be done. 
the vineyards to be tended to, all kinds of stuff. The vineyards, that's what reminded me of Italy as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's something very warm about mm. the second one. Yes. And your process of transformation is in that dream. Totally. Mm, absolutely, yes. Yes. I, it was I, so clear, I, yeah. Oh, totally. I wonder how much has already happened. Hmm. Because huh? because the dream, the house is there. It's yeah. already occurred. Yeah. It's already wow. happened. Yeah, wow. it is. That's amazing. Let me let me share the first dream then because okay. this 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 it will take t- 1 minute. Um, okay. I'm sharing it because everything you've said actually makes a lot of sense because the first dream was a house, but it was a haunted house. And I had this when I was probably about 25 and there was a room I didn't want to go into. All the other rooms were inhabited and I was forced into this upper attic room where this little girl had been abused and her ghost had been left there. And I had to go into the room. I was forced into it and I had to, there was a man who was going to join me in that room. He was going to pray with me and exercise this ghost and he got down on his knees he prayed the room was totally cleared out the next scene in the room was it was totally cleared out and I remember clearly the window was open the room was painted white it was just a a simple bed um everything was white white sheets and there was a nice breeze blowing into the room and then I wasn't afraid anymore because I know I knew this ghost had been exercised and I had that in my mid twenties. And then I've had this new dream now at 33 in the last couple of months. So, but I definitely connected them with, you know, the houses and yeah. But, so. but I also think that in the first one, um, there was a room that you didn't want to go into. Yes. In the first dream, oh. in my early twenties. Yeah. My 20s. yeah. And, and you did go into it. I did. Yes. Did. It because you had to go into it. See, it's yes. it's a little bit like we were talking about the forgiveness. You had to go into the very place that you were afraid of, but you were not alone, right? You were not alone. You had kind of, you said a priest. Well, they're oftentimes called fathers. So you had yes. a better father figure who was with you, transforming the whole story for you. And even to the point where the room is no longer dark, but now white. Hmm. Is that correct? It was dark at the Absolutely. beginning. Absolutely. Now it's white. Yes. So you've gone from dark to light. Hmm. And you could, I mean, you we could make lots of spiritual associations as well, going from the dark to the light. Yes. But I think the, that dream released you to be able to go on to where you are now. It's almost like, you know, an exorcism relates to evil. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, it actually says that's what you were around and that's what you had to deal with was evil. Yes, yes and absolutely. You did. And you did. You dealt with mm-hmm. the evil. You had help. You, you yes. Look at how the dream helped you. This is, this is exactly how people do it. And, and in that, that, all that bad energy is out of you. It's, it's not there. Mm-hmm. And you're protected. Once you've had the exorcism, you're protected. It doesn't come back. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what the mm-hmm. priest is for as well. So you've got a good figure inside of you to help you through. He came. You didn't even ask him. He somehow came there. Yeah, yeah. So he's in you. Mm. You don't need right. You could always ask him. I need help. He will come. Mm. That that's my thought. Yeah, mm. I I would say a hundred percent agree with you. And I would you know because I am someone who believes in you know the spiritual world and the 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 biblical thing of you know God is the heavenly Father. And then also having a really good, um, uh, actually at that time in my life, someone actually did come into my life and he was a very good father figure to me. But I've actually only connected that dream now as you've spoken to me about it. So thank you. That's been helpful. Yes, but I also think the good father is in you. Yes. Yeah, and that's very spiritual. 
in yes. the sense in the sense of accessing all the spirit of oneself as well mm. Mm. yeah and whatever is beyond us mm -hmm. yes that's that's great we'll leave it there that's <laughs> what a fantastic conversation thank you thank you so much i have totally appreciated